Hi everyone, I'm Ruthie Fierberg. I am an arts journalist here in New York City, the creator and host of the Why We Theater podcast and the former executive editor at a little known publication called Playbill. It is my privilege to welcome you tonight to Second Stage's Second Stream, my first time with playwrights Alexis Scheer and Roberto Aguirre Sacasa. Welcome to Alexis and Roberto. There they are. Hi. Hi. So for those of you who don't know, Alexis made her professional debut with her play, Our Dear Dead Drug Lord at Second Stage Uptown. And Roberto got his illustrious career started as well with Second Stage, his play, uh, My Mystery Plays, Uptown at Second Stage, and then years later, his play, Good Boys and True, in the Midtown off-Broadway space. So we are thrilled to have both of these Second Stage artists here tonight and you know, look out for their plays as they continue on in the world because they are absolutely still being done. So thank you both so much for being here tonight. Ha happy to be here. Yeah, thank you for having us. Absolutely. Um, I mean, the wonderful thing is that Second Stage is such, you know, a launch pad for artists and for, you know, long careers such as the two of yours. Alexis, I wanna start with you. You've said that this play, Our Dear Dead Drug Lord, was where you discovered your authentic voice. Now, for those of you who didn't see it, just a little bit of a primer, um, her play, your play, as I'm sitting here looking at you, uh, focuses on a group of high school friends, um, all women, who get together after school for the Dead Leaders Club meetings, and they, are obsessed with summoning the spirit, particularly of one dead leader, Pablo Escobar, who you know was the leader of the drug cartel in Colombia. So when you talk about your authentic voice, what about the way in which you crafted the story? What about the subject or the dialogue was Alexis to you? What did you find? Um, I think, I mean, so much of it. I think um, part of being a kind of like a baby playwright is a lot of the, my first place, I won't speak for every playwright, but you, when you're figuring out how to write plays, you start writing plays in the voice of other playwrights. And that's kind of, that was my way to figure out how, where my voice is. And, you know, you're reading a lot of plays as a student and I'm like, I'm going to try and write the the Sarah Rule play or the Roberto play. Um, yep. And, and you're, you're, I think figuring out where you live and what you have to say in the world. And uh, in grad school, um, you know, I was encouraged a lot to go home in my life. I think there's like, when you grow up, you think your childhood is very pedestrian, very normal, because it's just your experience. Right. And so I grew up in Miami. Way. And, yeah. And so I grew up in Miami and um, I, I was thinking a lot about, uh, being a teenager in this very like a adult town um, and, and growing up, you know, at the time that I did, the play is set in 2008 and thinking, you know, when the I started writing the play, it was right after the 2016 election. So I was thinking a lot about how, like, how did we get here? And I was thinking a lot about this idea of the pendulum swinging, um, you know, kind of violently to the right. So when was the last time it swung the other way? And I thought about electing Obama for the first time I was in high school. And so it was just sort of like reacquainting myself with a younger version of me and everyone who I grew up with. And um, I don't know. And I, I think reading uh, Sarah DeLapp's play, The Wolves was also pretty like wonderful. And that I read it and said like, I can do this. Like, <laughs> like I'm so glad people care about the lives of teen girls. I was a teen yes. girl. I I have things to say about this. So I feel like all of those things started to just click together. Mm, I love it. So Roberto, did you feel similarly about the mystery plays or even a little later about Good Boys and True? Like how do you describe your authentic voice and what were those plays uh, parts, their roles in forming it? Yeah, um, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it is, it's, it's funny. I, uh, I also have to say, I saw Alexis's play uh, at, 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 at the Uptown Space 
And it, 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 you know, and she knows this, it completely blew me away. Mm-hmm. And I immediately reached out to Carol Rothman at Second Stage and I was like, tell me everything about this playwright. Um, and, and one of the reasons I loved it is one, because even, you know, even hearing you say, you know, you were discovering your voice, it was so confident and it was a voice that was unlike any other vo- vo- voice kind of that, that, I, that, I'd, that I'd heard. And, it, and, and I also felt a kindred spirit with it because it had spooky uh, uh, elements and supernatural elements, including a ghost and, and the mystery plays, which I'd done, uh, which Second Stage had produced, you know, 15 years earlier in the same theater also had ghosts. And, and, and it was two, it's sort of two stories and one was sort of a horror story. And then one was, was more kind of a ghost story and a memory story play. Uh, but, but I think, you know, when, I, you know, when, I, when I look back at that play, I do think that it combined so many of my passions and obsessions, horror, ghosts, uh, uh, themes of redemption, themes of forgiveness. And, 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 you know, the mystery plays especially was sort of a, a little bit of a weird play. It was almost a monologue play. Uh, uh, and, and I often think back to that playwright that I was young, uh, the younger playwright who kind of was like, I'm going to write a weird play that has horror elements, even though there aren't usually those in plays and things like that. So it was, it was, and, and, and I think the genres that I was playing with in that play, I think have come up in other works that I've, that I've done. And I, and like I said, I, I definitely saw, saw a lot of those cool elements in Alexis's play. So it's just a fun story. I was going to say, like, speaking of authentic voice, like, and Alexis, I'll ask you the reverse in a moment. What was it about her voice that was striking you? What qualities were you picking up on that you said, I need to know this playwright, regardless of theme, uh, commonalities yeah well I think it I think first of all it 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 I saw uh uh the wolves as well and loved the wolves loved the and wolves. I, I'd seen there was also I think it was on that trip or or a trip before to New York I, I'd seen this really cool production of Macbeth down at the Lucille Hortel which was Macbeth as done by four or five prep school girls. Good. I'm obsessed yeah. with that production. And, and and it was like, they were acting out the play of Macbeth. And then towards the end of the play, uh, the, the girls sort of leave Macbeth behind and then they kind of commit a horrific act of violence. And when I saw our dear dead drug Lord, I was like, ooh, this, this place tapping into something that's happening right now mm. that that that, that uh, young uh, uh, women playwrights are, are are exploring and and I thought the voices of the girls were so great also the sense of humor as dark as it was there was sort of a wicked um, wit to it and and then the kind of the last thing was, I was genuinely shocked in that play. Like, like, like there, there is also an act of, of, of violence in it. And I was like, wow, it's been a long time since I've gone to a play and been uh, shocked and disturbed by something that I've seen. Usually it's all pretty, um, you know, uh, 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 down the middle sort of boulevard comedies or, or, uh, uh, or kind of, uh, 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 living room dramas and th- and this just it, it just really you know it it, it large kind of departure off. from that yeah exactly 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 Absolutely. so all of those things were like I gotta know more about this playwright so and Alexis for you I mean you were saying that in finding your voice you first started out imitating the people you admired Roberto included so what is it about his voice and his writing that you latch on to. I think it's, you know, it's exactly what Roberto is saying. It's those elements of horror. It's the elements of, um, I think, scandal. Um, I I read Good Boys and True um, as an undergrad. And before this panel, I like reread it because I'm like, I haven't read this in a while, actually. And I was just reminded, I'm like, oh, this is like talking about a, a lot of things that I think, you know, I, I didn't see it in 2008. I, I was 
in Miami in high school, um, but just kind of talking about a thing, a lot of things I don't think we were ready to talk about. And, and there are certain like taboos that, I don't know, um, felt really familiar. Um, and, and I also, of, of course, Roberto is this like Titan in the TV world as well. And, um, and has created so many like memorable worlds and characters and you know I, I'm like a big Riverdale fan obviously um and you know he also loves musicals and makes it known in all of his shows so I feel like there's just so much like in common and similar likes so yeah yeah and just to catch make sure everyone I know we have subscribers in the room so the likelihood is that you've seen these plays but um, Roberto's play, like you said, the mystery plays was two one acts, spooky ghost stories starring a uh, little known star, Gavin Creel, by the way. I don't think I didn't notice Roberto that you have consistently excellent talent who are met, who are drawn to your work. Yeah, that was, so not, yeah, that. That, was that was fun. He was, and he was great in it. He was great. Yeah. In it. yeah. And good boys and true. I mean, could be written yesterday, yeah. <laughs> but is set in the 1980s um, at a boys prep school and a sex tape emerges. And it's not just a sex tape. I mean, as you read it, especially in today's lens, like it, it's the tape of a violent sexual crime. Um, and, you know, there are these questions of privilege and will the perpetrator be punished for this? Will it be swept under the rug? How is the culture of the boys' school responsible for this? How is the general culture of how we raise boys and men responsible for this writ large? Um, all important questions. And I mean, this is what I love about Second Stage too, is that Second Stage brings work that ask important questions. And so, having you know had such early moments at second stage i'm wondering like what at second stage helped you find your authenticity um what distinguishes second stage from other places where you've worked and you've worked at such reputable places so it's not a comparison of better or worse but really like what is the thing that makes second stage um the place for certain plays of yours Roberto, you go first. I'll, I'll go first. Okay. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I, 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 you know, my husband's a stage manager. He's he's done. He's stage managed plays at Second Stage, and I, and he's worked at a lot of other theaters. Same as same as I have. I think for me, one of the biggest differences is uh, the theater's mission, which is to produce living American playwrights, mm -hmm. and that's what they do. That's their priority, and and the writer is at 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 the heart of 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 that, and 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 by the way, you know, uh, 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 there are other theaters that have s similar missions, uh, uh, but but you know, in a you know, there are so many environments where writers are devalued, most of them in Hollywood. Uh, but even even in New York, and it, it, it and that's not the case at Second Stage. It's 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 sort of about about the the the, the writer. Yeah, writer and, first. And for me, looking back on that, you know, I, that was the first time I was treated as a as a as a as a real playwright. And I'd done a lot. I, I produced a lot of plays myself, and and. But that was the, you know, I remember Carol saying, you don't have to worry about marketing your show. You don't have to worry about filling your seats. You don't have, we do that. You focus on, 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 on being a writer and it, and, and, you know, not only that, I think when, when second stage committed to doing my play, I was still in grad school and, you know, Carol and her artistic staff came to, to visit me at school and saw a play I was doing at school. And I was like, wow. They're really investing in mm. me as an artist, not just you know far beyond the, this play. So I think for someone kind of starting their playwriting career, it was a huge uh, uh, boost of confidence, and it was incredible support to to do that scary thing. So I, I think those were some of the things absolutely that that, that I got out of it. Alexis, what about for you and, you know, being at Uptown, it was a co-production with the WP Theater, but what was it about Second Stage that helped you find that authentic voice during the process? Um, 
I mean, the, of course, all the support, I, I think with the co-production, it was just this great constellation of pe people who were there to like make all my dreams come true. I mean, it was like really the best. And then I think, you know, Second Stage also really brought this level of um, respect and legitimacy uh, that I, I wasn't aware of like the scale until I, it was funny, it was like shortly, I think, at, or just before we started rehearsal, I was in Ireland, I was in Galway at an ice cream shop one night. And um, I think somebody was singing like a Broadway musical number, a show mm -hmm. tune, like you do in an ice cream shop. And I think I made a comment and the guy at the counter working was like, oh, do you like musicals? And I'm like, I love musicals. And we talked a little bit about musicals and he's like, oh, do you work in the theater? I'm like, I'm a playwright. And he's like, oh, do you, what do you do? I'm like, I actually have a show going off Broadway. And he's like, oh, what theater? And I'm like, it's a co-production and blah, 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 and second stage. And he's like, oh, I know second stage. They did. And they like rattled off all of these shows that premiered at second stage. And it was just like, and the fact, and then he looked at me, he's like, you're a real playwright. I'm like, ah, I guess I am. I, I, yeah, I have a show. At yeah. But lending stage. that legitimacy, even wow. Internationally, that is incredible. I was like shook by it. <laughs> Crazy. So I want to get into the substance of both of your works. I mean, I'm not a horror person, but I actually think that this makes me the right person to ask about this because it's not like inherent to me in my core. It's you to the dark side of things. Like what about the spooky, the horror, the dark, the sometimes violent appeals to you? Hmm. I can start. Go for it. <laughs> I think because it's funny. I actually like. I'm a scaredy cat. I'm like. <laughs> I'm not good at watching horror movies. I have to watch them like in the daytime at home with okay, all the that's, lights that's on. Um, and and I think for me in writing it, because um, I love using those elements, it, it's a line in the play, which I think is the thesis of that play and also a thesis maybe in like a lot of my other writing, which is um, a line one of the characters says, and she says, I can't be scared if I'm what's scary. And so I think this is a way for me to cope with all of the, because we live in a very scary and violent world. Yeah. Um, and I think that this is the way that me as just a human has found like an outlet and a, a release to make sense of all of the violence in the world and to have control over it, I think is like, I think where I, I come to it from. And also, you know, I think in it's a part of life. And, and so if we're trying to reflect life and the human condition, sorry, that's my puppy who's growling in the corner. Um, if we're trying to reflect life and the human condition that horror is just a part of it um yeah Roberto does that illuminate anything for you yeah. you, you know it did it, it's funny it's 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 something that it's a question that I think I've been asked you know my entire life from even when I was a kid and my parents were like why do you like these things and I've always I always um even when I was a kid I I loved I loved reading, I loved writing uh, uh, stories and things like that. And they were always, they were all always sort of uh, uh, horror stories. I loved reading Edgar Allan Poe and I loved, you know, I, I, I like many teens started a Stephen King phase, which continues mm -hmm. to the, to this day. And, and I'm, I'm not exactly sure why I like it. I, I like the catharsis of going to a, uh, 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 a spooky, mo uh, a scary movie, screaming, and then you kind of laugh afterwards. And and there's weirdly something reassuring about about vampires and ghosts and like because and and which is you know presumably because they don't exist. And and you you can experience something, and then and then it sort of does it does sort of fortify you to face sort of real horrors in in a way or escape from re real horrors. So I think that, that there's that, but I, but I, I think it was just how I was wired. I've always sort of uh, 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 loved that, and 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 even when I was discovering, you know, plays and stuff. I think the first time I really, really uh, fell in love with the theater was actually when I saw a a much more traditional version of Macbeth. I was in D.C. Mm. 
and it was at the Folger uh, Theater. And I had not, I had not even read Macbeth, and it was like, wait, there's like all these people are getting killed, and ghosts are appearing, and there are witches and curses. And and it was like, and it sort of was like, I love all these things, and that sort of was my. And I, you know, one of the first musicals that I fell in love with was Sweeney Todd, which is about a serial killer yep. and a cannibal. And it was like, wow, this is this is great. So so it's 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 just something that's that's always been touchstones for me. Yeah, Sondheim is a lot twistier than some people realize because people think about you know act one of Into the Woods or Sunday in the Park or Company. And then you're like, yeah, but Sweeney Todd and Assassins are two of them. <laughs> and the second act of Into the Woods, like we take a turn. Um, so I, I love hearing though, that it was introduced to you so young. I mean, I think the other thing is like, I'll say this as an audience member and sometimes as a reader as well, when I read like thriller novels or something, I. I have this presumption that twisted stories come from twisted people, like that you have to be Patrick Bateman to write Patrick Bateman. Um, and yet you two are both just in our meeting, you know, before this conversation and now you're two of the sunniest people I've ever met. And so like, is it for a catharsis? Is it because you're trying to understand the, the psychology behind people who do this in real life? Like, what's the like especially when we go into the violence not just the wickedness but like actual violence like what's the process for you what are you hoping to fulfill um i it, it's funny because i think like a lot of people uh, who don't know me saw my play and the first question is like are you okay and then uh, the, all the people who do know me it's like this all makes sense this is so you even though like i many of the things that happen in the play is very far from my experience. Yeah, I mean, let's just put it out there. Like the first thing that happens is they break the neck of a cat yes, and you don't I've... see it, it's in a box, but like, that's the first thing that happens <laughs> until we escalate all the way to the end of a very bloody, um, I don't know if we should say it, but like- I, I mean, think we can just say it. There's yeah, the play a ending. anger abortion. Yeah. Um, and I, I think I can talk about like technically speaking, um, the, the escalation of violence and how I went about that. I, um, Sarah Kane is one of my favorite playwrights. I think Blasted is like a hugely seminal work just in, in my life. I saw like the second US production when I was in high school and I was probably too young to see it. And it like blew up my whole world in the best way. And, um, and so it, it she taught me in her work how how you like you start off with the small violences and then you lead up and so i was thinking a lot in drug lord i think the um you know a lot of people ask like what are the trigger warnings how do we prepare an audience for this and i think the like the secret one is like this is a play about are girls who are summoning Pablo Escobar. And if you know anything about Pablo Escobar, he is a, uh, a narco-terrorist, a murderous narco-terrorist who um, uh, ruined a country uh, for a very long time. Um, and my mom is Colombian. I feel like this is all part of my like, you know, lineage and I am, it's all just connected. Um, and and so I, I thought like, okay, that is your first warning that things are going to happen. This is not, you know, we're not summoning Santa Claus. Um, and then I knew in the first like 10 minutes, we have to do something um, that lets you know that this is a play where things are going to happen that are going to make you feel uncomfortable. So we're going to, we're going to kill a cat and you're not going to see it. And you're going to have that, that distance. There's going to be a joke right after it. So you get, you know, a chance to recover, but also like buckle up. So I think that's where I started because I knew where it was going. Mm. And was it a catharsis for you? What are you trying to process? Like what goes on in the minds of? I think, you know, hindsight is really like 2020. I feel like I've gotten really good at trying to get. There's my cat, Alexis. Don't kill her. Uh, hi, Miss Kitty. No, I love cat. I would never harm an animal. Um, but I, I think there was something about um, where I was in 2016 or early 2017 when I started writing the play feeling very um out of power um and writing about a girls who summon 
their power and summon of violent power because I was feeling the world was just destructive and going to hell. Um, so I, I was ready to go there. And so I think there was catharsis in, in that sense. And um, yeah, and also just trying to like, you know, pick apart psychology and, and young girls and why they do things. I think um, it, teenagers are, are are very impulsive. And, you know, I think about Romeo and Juliet happens in three days. That's like a great touch point. Like things just escalate pretty quickly when you're a teenager. Yeah. So I mm -hmm. think that that's what gives me, give us, gives us permission to go there and go there quickly. Really good point. Really good point. Roberto, same general question for you, but also, you know, as it specifically applies to good boys and true and what you were trying to understand and investigate there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I think both, both the mystery plays and, and the, and good boys and true both, both were sort of based loosely on, 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 on events or people in my life. Uh, the mystery plays, one of my best friend, when she was a, a young girl, her older brother killed her parents and her younger sister. She's one of my best friends. And I, 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 I was, you know, when she first told me that I, 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 I couldn't even process it. And I couldn't even process how she survived that night and, and, and gone on to be a really successful uh, businesswoman. So I think the mystery plays was trying to understand what could have happened in that house that led to that terrible, terrible uh, uh, night. Um, and, and, you know, I'm also like always drawn to true crime and, uh, you know, even now all the documentaries and, and stuff like that. And, and in Good Boys, I had gone to a prep school. I actually went to the same prep school that Brett Kavanaugh went to, though after Brett Kavanaugh. Um, and, and I'd always wanted to write about, about that experience. And, and, you know, I want, I want to say that at that time, there were tons of articles about, uh, you know, football players, uh, you know, committing rape or, or hazing or things like that. Although I think those are always happening. It's, you know, um, but I, I kind of wanted to understand what would, what would make a teenage boy think he could do that. And, and, you know, in both of the, in both the mystery plays and in good boys, you know, the mystery of did they or didn't they is solved early. Mm -hmm. And then, and then sort of what, 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 what um, the rest of the play is concerned with is trying to untangle the why of that. And, and, you know, it's funny, I, with good boys, it's a play that, that, you know, I think second stage did probably like 12 or 13 years ago. But 2008. Yeah, 2008. And then I would say a year or two ago, uh, when, when Brett Kavanaugh was, was, was uh, sworn into the Supreme Court, uh, uh, I revisited that play and, and, and felt like I could wrestle with some of its themes uh, uh, even more deeply that, 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 than I did. But it's 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 very much trying to understand that and and try to make sense of something that I myself uh, 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 was was uh, uh, witness to or glanced at, uh, up against. Mm -hmm. So it was it was definitely wrestling with that stuff uh, uh, textually. Now, interestingly enough, oh, go ahead, Alexis. Go I, ahead. I just like feel like bo both Good Boys and True and and Drug Lord are both trying to like wrestle with toxic masculinity. Yeah. Um, it yes, I just that's the thing I want to pause it. Oh, that's my dog. She agrees. Yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> well, but what's so interesting is that I mean, Alexis, the toxic masculinity in your play is not on stage because we don't have any of the boys or men on stage. So tell me how you were incorporating that. Like, was that something you discovered along the way that you're like, oh, this is about toxic masculinity, or was it a focused, um, was it a focused point you wanted to make? just without the men there? I think I knew that this was a play about girls trying to um, reach, grab power. And I knew that in 2008, they had a very limited patriarchal idea of what power is and looks like, which mm. is why they can look at somebody like Pablo and be like, 
yeah, he did some bad things, but this was a guy who had power, like real power. Um, so I, I, yeah. That's so interesting. And that the model of power is a violent man. So then we become violent mm -hmm. um, to claim our power. Oh, that's so fascinating. Um, Roberto, with Good Boys and True, what's interesting that's opposite of Alexis's play, Alexis's play, we end up, you know, having a very violent scene. In your play, the, the tape is, from what I could tell reading the script, you never see it. Um, there's never a showing. So what is the power in not showing violence and, and how do you know when to show it and when to hold back? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a really, that's a really, really good question. You know, I think when I, when I, when I, when I wrote Good Boys, I remember that, that, that we wanted, because of it was sort of a mystery, uh, it was in a way its own mystery play. I think there, there was a sense that, that there's, that, that, that whatever the encounter was between the boy and the girl, that it, it, it had some, some ambiguity. I think in the intervening years since the play happened, we've seen that that it's not it's not as ambiguous as as perhaps I I, I originally thought. And I was well, and certainly I, in the time period that you said it, it would have absolutely have been considered ambiguous for for, for sure, for sure. And and uh, uh, it's it's it, it it also it was so much about what you know, what the mother, uh, what, what, the, what the mother took away when she saw the tape and, and what she was trying to, the story she was trying to tell herself. And, and it felt, and it, it it's interesting because I've, I've since been adapting it for, um, for television and, uh, uh, that, that, you know, on TV, you're supposed to show everything and not, and not talk about it. Well, you're supposed to talk about it and show it and then keep talking about it. Um, but but we we so we are showing it, though it's delayed, so that we can kind of play with with people's responses and and people's opinions about what it is before we actually see the thing ourselves, and then and then have all of the evidence to judge for ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, for 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 a long time, and when you when you haven't seen the tape, all you're really doing is is sitting in judgment of what the characters actions are and you don't don't know what they what they know um but I, but but i also think it's there's a there's a great tradition of sort of you know the old fashioned well made play which mm. the mystery plays is not uh uh of you know we're in a living room we're in a fancy living room we're going to see fancy people talking about this thing that we're keeping off stage because uh uh decorum tells us do you do yeah. you know what i mean yeah and well you had the designer of fancy living rooms as your i mean derek no one makes a living room like derek mclean and derek and, McLean and, and, and by the way i remember for the second stage production the director scott ellis who's such a wonderful director was like and we're gonna have automation and i was like oh my god i've, I've really arrived i have a fancy <laughs> i have a fancy living room that tracks on stage uh, uh, it was like, okay, I've arrived, I've arrived. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, Alexis, I'm curious too, I, I, I wanna ask both of you about, like, do you know in these two particular plays, did you know your ending and were you writing towards that or was your ending something that you discovered? Um, I knew, uh, I knew a few things about the play when I started writing the play. I'll be honest and figure out and say that I didn't figure out the plot until maybe draft four or five, but I knew the play is gonna start with a seance and they're gonna try and summon Pablo Escobar and at the end of the play, they are going to succeed. And I just had to get from point A to point B. And I think the, the thing that I really wrestled with was the, um, the coat hanger abortion and what, which is what happens in the final seance. And that is how they, you know, that's the thing that gives permission for Pablo to enter the space. And, um, and that just came from a lot of uh, conversation with different playwrights and, uh, and colleagues and sounding boards in my life. And uh, somebody gave me a, a great note and said, stop thinking logically, this is illogical. It has to be illogical. And I was like, 
okay, what is the, what is the far reach thing? Um, and what is the, if we're summoning Pablo, what is the brutality? What it has to cost something. What is the cost of that? So that's, that's and also just to say, to build up what Roberta was just saying, like this isn't your living room play. So you have a lot more space to, to move around in for sure. Mm -hmm. What about you, Roberta? Were you writing towards that final confrontation with the mother and son always? Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting that, that, that what, I, what I, and it's, you know, it's been a minute, but when I look back on it, I, I will say that I think that that I started writing a play about this about this boy, and as the play, um, as I worked on the play over over you know uh, uh, months and and years or however long it took to write, it it started to become about about um, more about the mother or as much about the mother as the boy, and that th th I didn't set out to to write that play. I, I it was more like oh this is great I'm going to write a, a a play with all these like prep school boys and it's going to be a hot house atmosphere and. And all that stuff, but it but it did shift to become more a play about the mother and, and about the about the family. And and weirdly, the 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 most toxic character, the father, who is also off 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 stage. Um, but but so no, not not I I I think the play uh, uh, changed as I was writing and working on it. I don't think I had I had that the 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 last final kind of confrontation. Hmm. And so again, and one of the things I love about that ending is this isn't, you know, we end with the mother who is really investigating her own culpability yeah. in her, the actions of her son in the cultural culpability of all of that and saying like, you know, that it isn't um, one or the other. It's not, I love my son, therefore he could never do this. It's, I love my son and something allowed him to do yeah. that and yeah. that um that full embrace of there is guilt here and there is there's blood on all of our hands um did that feel groundbreaking to you at the time because I feel like even today you know on television stuff there are parent-child relationships where it's like you know one or the other defends to the death and they could have never rather than admitting guilt yeah, it's it's yeah, it's it's a really good question. I didn't I didn't feel I didn't feel like it was groundbreaking, but but it it was sort of like one of the things that I was curious about is is you know are some acts unforgivable and what what, what do you do if someone you love commits an atro an atrocity like like this and and do you stop loving them? Or, or how do you um, how do you push through that or find your way way through that? And it, and it's interesting. I the the, the I, and I, I I have to look back to when it happened. But another play that really was resonating with me when I was writing Good, Good Boys was the Edward Albee play uh, The Goat, which is about a a fancy you know society woman who discovers that her husband is having an affair with the goat, literally having an affair with the goat. And, and it was sort of like, how do I make sense of this person that I built a life with? And, mm -hmm. and you know, to a much less extreme uh, 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 circumstance, I think that's what, 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 what the mother's struggling with in, in, um, in Good Boys, eventually discovering that she's as culpable as her son in some ways and if he's a monster, then she's a monster, and 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 she contributed to that. It's, 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 yeah, it's 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 sort of messy, but 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 it felt at the time the truest ending for that play. Yeah, and I mean, I think it works because it's messy. You know yeah. that that's what makes it feel so real. Um, I'm also curious, just as you're writing. Um, I mean, Alexis, you were talking about building an escalation to violence. And I think that there, I'll ask you first, is there a difference between violence for shock and earned violence? Um, and then does all violence need to be earned? How do you know you've earned it if you feel it does need to be earned? 
Um, that's a good question. Um, I think I like to think that, um, I, or I hope that the violence that I write is in service of story and plot and narrative and, um, and is pushing our characters forward. Um, and, and cause I don't want to write gratuitous violence. I, I think there's plenty of that in the world. Um, but I, I, I don't wanna prescribe that all playwrights should think that way. If a playwright wants to write something for shock value that is allowed to exist, there's space for all of it. Um, so I think that's where I come come to it. And, and I, I like to think like, how is this sort of story? Yeah. Roberto, would you agree with that? Yeah, you know, I, I you know, it's funny. I also, I, uh, Alexis, you mentioned Sarah Kane and, and there was a there, there was a production of Blasted in New York off Broadway. I will, I will keep saying five years ago, but I'm sure it was probably now 15 years ago with Reed Burney and and God, I think it was like maybe Marin Ireland or something. And it it, it was and it, it it had it's in it's both famous and infamous that play for for its violence. And and I remember going to see it with 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 my husband and 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 you know I I do have I love horror movies I watch horror movies all the time he's not he's not that he watches kind of like Pixar movies and things like that and 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 we were talking a lot about about violence and and it's it's interesting you know now kind of working in television and working on shows that that are primarily about teenagers and, and young people, you know, including even the the thing that I'm doing with Alexis right now. There's a lot of violence in it, and and it's interesting because there's horror movie violence, like there's a slasher running around with a mask killing people, but sort of alongside that, there's this this very strong story about uh, sexual violence that's been committed against these high school girls. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, I know that even as we, and we've talked about both of these things, it's kind of what we talk about almost in, in every meeting. And, and there is a difference, I think, be, be, between the sort of the horror movie slasher, you know, almost like campy American horror story violence, yeah. and then there's real sexual violence. So, so I think there are so many different kinds of kinds of violence mm -hmm. but I I do feel like when we when we are, we're talking about that when we're talking about the violence committed against these these girls or 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 even girls commit young girls younger girls committing these acts of violence uh, uh teenagers I do feel like there is a kind of responsibility to get the, be th as thoughtful as you can be about it and understand what it means and and that it might mean something different to uh, uh, people other than you yeah uh, so I find myself listening a lot it's mostly it's mostly it's a, it, it, in the in that writer's room it's mostly women it's me and one other guy and I think um eight women so I find myself listening to 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 what they're saying and and not and you know being really comfortable in the horror movie slasher thing yeah uh, but listening to when we're talking about the other kinds of violence. Yeah, for those of you who don't know in our audience, the beautiful thing is that Alexis and Rojo are now working together um, on Pretty Little Liars Original Sin that will be for HBO Max. So uh, Alexis is part of Roberto's writer's room. So like second stage artists unite. <laughs> we love to see it. Um, you talk about, you know, specifically working in these stories um, around teenagers. I'm curious for both of you, what is fun and what is meaningful about writing for that age group of character? Alexis, do you want to jump in? Yeah. Um, I think, I mean, what's fun is uh, everything is, so many of the things that you're writing are first experiences. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a lot of you know, it, coming of age stories, it, it's just very rich, uh, fertile land um, because everything is just new and um, hormones are crazy and uh, you, you know, your brain is not fully developed. So you experience things on a like 
Shakespearean level. Everything is epic. Yeah. Um, and then for, you know, and then there's the aspect of, for me, it really like helped taps it right into my purpose as an artist, which is, I think, you know, creating meaningful roles for young women. I, you know, acting was my entry point into playwriting. Um, so when I first, you know, started writing, it was like really just trying to write myself roles and write the kind of roles I wanted to play, the kind of roles my friends wanted to play because we just didn't, it wasn't there. I was doing scenes in high school from like Angels in America, which, you know, right. a great play, but I was too young to do that. Where were the age appropriate things for me to like sink my teeth in? Cause I really right. wanted that meaty, meaty work. And I think, you know, now of course we're riding this great wave of like so many great teen girl plays where they're actually, you know, written by young women as opposed to older white men telling us what our experience is. I'm not looking at you, Roberto. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I think that there's that part. I love writing those roles knowing like, and I get DMs on Instagram from uh, like college kids saying like, can I have your script? I want to do this scene. And it's like, yes, this is what it's for. Yeah. So, oh, how rewarding. Totally. That's awesome. What about for you in this age group? Since Roberto, you play in this age group, it seems nonstop. It's funny. Yeah, it's funny. And, and I, I will say that, that I think Alexis's teens are a lot more authentic than, 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 than mine. You know, I get it. I, it, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't intentional. Um, um, you know, even, even good boys, you know, again, the, the, the focus sort of shifted from, from the teen boys to, to, to the older characters, the mother specifically. Uh, yeah, I've sort of fallen into this, uh, 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 you know, I don't want to call it a niche um, be because I really, I really do enjoy it. And I, and, and, and I like, I think, you know, what's, what's interesting or rewarding in particular for, for me now, and I sort of kind of made my peace with this is that, you know, shows that focus on young people have very passionate fan bases mm. and these stories are very meaningful to the 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 young people who see these stories and 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 want to see themselves in this story and and uh especially now when there is there is so much uh uh hunger for uh uh inclusion and representation and authenticity and 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 uh uh uh, things like that. I mean, it, even even when I was approached by Warner Brothers to do Pretty Little Liars, which which is a you know is a is a classic teen show, because that was all about about women. I was like, well, if I'm if I'm going to do this, I definitely have to do it with a partner who's uh, uh, younger, a, a female who can more authentically capture the psychology and 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 voices of, of, of these girls, we put together a room that was almost all women. Mm. Um, um, so so it's, 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 I think it, it's, it's knowing that these stories will matter a lot to the, to the kids who see it. And, and they're, they they get really invested in, and, and it can kind of make a difference in their lives. I think yeah. is probably uh, uh, the most rewarding aspect for me. Yeah, I love that. We have a question from the audience that is a little bit related to this. So it's from, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Tav Holmes. It might be Tave, but I think it's Tav Holmes. Um, it is the premise of many modern plays that one can only be what one sees modeled or represented in childhood or in important moments. Um, I have never found that to be true, this person says, and it seems to be an especially problematic idea for the plays you two write. Is that an aspect either of you consciously go contrary to or you want to speak towards? So I guess this idea of, of perhaps writing characters um, that other people can see to, to believe, whether that's a culpable mother or um, a powerful young teen, do you have to see it to believe it? And do you write to show people things that they can be, or do you just write what you write? I think 
I'll go ahead. No, oh, go ahead. no you go ahead. <laughs> no, I'm not sure if I under, I'm not sure if I totally understand the question, but I, but if, if the young characters in, in my plays say, I, I, I don't think I agree with the premise that they do what they've seen. Mm -hmm. In other words, in, in Good Boys, the, you know, the, the, there is blame put on the mother and the father. But ultimately, I do think that there's a personal responsibility that that kid, that that kid has, regardless of what his mother or father may or may not have said to him or done or, or demonstrated to, to him. Mm -hmm. That said, you know, e even like on Pretty Little Liars, the, the story we're telling is a generational story. So you see our teen girls in 2021 making very different choices than when their mothers were teenagers in 1999. So I guess in that respect, we are in dialogue with what they've seen and what they've known their 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 mothers uh, uh, have done. But 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 so I guess that so I guess I retract my statement that I disagree. I do see a relationship, though it, I don't think it's I saw something and I must therefore reenact that. Mm -hmm. um, it can be I saw something and I am I am choosing to do different from that. If that's if that's the question, I'm not sure if it is. I I think I I my answer is similar. I think about like and I think with uh, uh, Drug Lord, there's the play about the four girls, and then I think there's the secret underneath play, which is a play about all their parents um, because I feel yep. like they're these monstrous presence um, and shape so much of their thoughts and the things that they say and uh and I think about them and the choices that they make and it's all psychology thinking about in what ways are they rebelling from their parents and in what ways are they um I don't know it, it's like that growing up moment where it's like these are the authority figures in my life and I'm going to do all the things that they model but I'm also going to start to rebel against them so I think yeah. it's that those two things playing against each other. Yeah, I mean, there is actually, I don't know if anyone out in the audience is familiar with the Hoffman Institute, but it's been around for like 30 or 40 years. Um, and it's like a wellness kind of like inner work, psychology kind of thing. And like the big um, foundation of it is that you are looking at behavioral patterns of yourself, identifying patterns, and then pattern tracing to see whether that came directly from one of your two parents or in response to one of your two parents. Do you do the same thing or do you do the inverse? So you're almost living that out in, in your work. <laughs> yeah, and it's not just parents too. I think it's also like um, entertainment, media, culture, all of that. Yeah. Like I remember like, you know, being a teenager and going to see a movie and that movie is gonna be your personality for the next few weeks. That's just like the rules of being a teenager. Yes. Um, and, and, you know, of course, like when I was that age, like Harry Potter was the big thing that was in theaters and had the new movie every year. And so, you know, everyone is identifying and making choices about their personality within the context of, you know, this bigger thing. Um, and I think astrology is like kind of doing that now, now that it's very mainstream. It's like, yeah. I do this because I'm a Capricorn. Um, yep. Yeah. yeah, that's definitely big, big in culture right now. I mean, on this see it to believe it thread, I think kind of what's amazing within the representational landscape of things about both of your plays is, I mean, Alexis, you were saying your mother is from Colombia. Um, so you are Latinx and Jewish and Roberto, like, I know that your family is from Nicaragua and, and yet neither of these plays in particular, and certainly looking at a larger body of work is about being let Latinx. It's not a like they could be played by actors who who are of that identity, but it's not about immigration. It's not about being a Latinx kid in school who gets made fun of for those traits. So I'm just wondering, you know, do you feel like that was a a freedom? Um, allowed to you by by any institution by second stage did you feel like you had to carve that out for yourself um and and generally like being able to write the stories you want to write regardless of who your characters are yeah you know I mean it's, it's funny I've, I've thought about over the years I've thought about about 
this specific thing a, a, a lot. And I, you know, even in the last two or three years, uh, uh, you know, with so much uh, 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 happening in the world and and such a such a big emphasis on inclusion and and representation and and equality and and all those things it's it's a it's we talk about that all the time and out out in in LA as as you guys do in in New York you know it's funny when I was at, I remember when I was in grad school one of my teachers said essentially why don't you write plays about being a Nicaraguan or being or or in Spanish or from or or from that you're from Central America, but you were raised in the States. And, and, and you know, I, I kind of thought about it a, a long time. And the big issue in my, in my life growing up was being gay in a Catholic household mm. from, and in a Latino family. That was sort of like the thing that I spent years wrestling with. So, so when I, if I, if I wrote identity plays, it was often like a kid's wrestling with their sexuality. Good Boys is a great, great example. Um, I think more recently, it's become more important to center narratives on, on, on Latinx characters, not specifically about being Latinx or, or as you said, being about, about uh, uh, issues. Like, like Pretty Little Liars is a great example. We have, there's a Latinx uh, character in a genre piece and it is important that she's Latinx, but it's not like her entire character is only defined by that. That's one part of a, right. of a, of a, of a, of a tapestry, but it, it is something that, that you're right for those early plays, you know, uh, uh, Good Boys. And, and even when we just did a production of that at Pasadena Playhouse a year ago, you know, I remember thinking, geez, should I make this, this character Latinx or, 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 uh, 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 and it kind of didn't feel right. Um, whereas, whereas when, it, when, when we were doing Riverdale, I was like, someone in the love triangle, either Archie, Betty, and Veronica is going to be Latinx. I don't know who, it could be any of them. And it ended well, and that up just being... speaks to, that just speaks to the storyline too, right? Like your casting has to serve your story and Good Boys is very much about privilege and white privilege. Correct. Correct. So yeah, Alexis, did you have anything to add on that count? Um, just that I think, you know, I, I try and write a lot of Latinx characters and a lot of Latinas. Um, mostly again, it's thinking about a 16 year old me opening up all the monologue books and the scene books, looking for stuff that feels like, uh, me. Um, and, but I don't know. I, I think it's like, is it, like identity for me isn't usually the narrative. Um, mm. It's the it's like just like background information that, that like it gives texture um, to to the the character and, and informs a lot of choices that they make. Certainly because you know I I grew up a very specific ways with a you know set of values and morals based on X Y and Z that you know right. I inherited. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I think it. Yeah, I don't have a, a well baked thought on that. I think I'm just <laughs> trying to write characters that that sound like real people. I was gonna say, um, I like just hearing from great, smart playwrights. You are both that, and just so grateful for Second Stage, you know, to have brought your work um, to audiences like me and and like our audience tonight. So. Um, you know, Alexis is under commission um, in a bunch of places, second stage included. Um, Roberto has, you know, plays galore as well as television series from Riverdale all the way back to Glee. And you can watch their collaboration on Pretty Little Liars Original Sin when it comes out. But until then, thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you to the two of you for giving us so much of your time and your knowledge. Thank you. Um, and all of you, all of your behind the scenes secrets. Um, it's really been a joy to talk with you. Great. Thank you all for tuning in. Thank you. Bye. See you tomorrow, Alexis. See you tomorrow. <laughs>